How you doing, Gabe? Doing good, Greg. How are you? Doing well, doing well. So last week we left off with Walker Percy's um, The Message in the Bottle, mm-hmm. which we're continuing one of our readings today coming from the same collection of essays that are titled The Message in the Bottle. But we were talking a lot about news and how does a, an artist get an audience's attention and this manner of like thinking about the responsibility of the artist. What are we supposed to be doing and how do we um, not just, you know, in, in I think the current cliche of what we think art is generally in culture, it's something to do with self-expression, which then it just seems like the responsibility is to express yourself. And if other people don't understand it, it's because they're fools. Whereas obviously we were discussing Percy and it's, it's like if you've got a message to send, you need to figure out how to send it in a manner that it might be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, so we discussed that a lot. I had you read Walter Benjamin's The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, and then Walker Percy's essay, The Delta Factor. And I'm not sure exactly why I paired these two, but I think there's, hopefully we'll get there in the conversation. But I'm wondering, you know, in your, what, what did you think of The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction? Yeah, so my first read through of it, it's definitely dense reading. My first read through of it, I was 100% just like, oh, I don't, I don't think I understand what he's saying, or I don't think I agree with him at all. Yeah. Um, I read it through a few more times, read a few like people's responses to, to what he was saying. Um, actually ended up talking about it with a couple of the other professors in the department who had some, some interesting thoughts on it. Mm. Um, and, and also I read a lot about Walter Benjamin's life. And with all of those things together, it made a lot more sense to me, a lot more mm. sense to me. And I ended up, it's really kind of grown on me um, as, as an essay and as something that like, I think is super, super important. Um, yeah, yeah. But the, the basics of the essay is uh, that Walter Benjamin says that essentially the, advance, the advancing uh, of technology is fundamentally changing the need and the use of art in human society and culture. Um, he's particularly focused on the photograph and the lithograph and essentially this idea that any visual image or any kind of artistic experience can be reproduced infinitely and recreated. And he says that the most direct result of that is that this thing called the aura of the artwork is being damaged by, yeah, by, this, yeah, by this reproduction. Right. That this kind of, this X factor that art has is starting to kind of be decreased Mm -hmm. and he proposes that this is in some ways a natural kind of progression of society and culture and it should be in some ways kind of embraced and we need to just kind of change how we're thinking about art in response to it right right yeah yeah that's that's a good summary of it um he uh so when he's talking like how did you uh, aura is a really weird word Mm -hmm. how did you understand what he was saying like what is what do you think Benjamin means when he says the aura of an artwork? Yeah, I uh, well this this probably jumps ahead pretty pretty far, but with Walker Percy, there's a lot of discussion about language, mm-hmm. and I believe that well what, one of Walker Percy's main points is that one of the things that's so special about language for us is that we kind of cease to see things linear like in a in a cause and effect sort of way. Mm -hmm. It isn't just that the word for water means that I'm going to encounter water sometime soon. It's that the word for water becomes water in a very strange way. And I believe that that's probably one of the best descriptions for what this aura is, that in some way the art isn't just a descriptor of whatever is happening, but in some ways the art actually has some level of, of interaction and becoming. Yeah. And then that destruction or the diminishing is in some ways a weakening of that link where, where things are becoming slightly less connected. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's probably important that we place Benjamin's essay. It was written in 1935. Mm-hmm. He's a Jew. Yep, Jew living, living in Germany. Germany. Yep. And he's looking at the German Nazi propaganda machine. And he begins, he's, he's eventually going to flee. I forget what year he dies. I think it's like 37 or 39 something or something like that. Like, yeah. like shortly after this, he's trying to escape. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
dies as he's trying to escape the Nazis, obviously. Um, but so he's seeing a strange period in time that is drastically changed. I mean, Hitler in particular had a huge uh, campaign against modern art. He called it degenerate art. Mm -hmm. um, and the Nazi propaganda machine was using, it was, it was like the first time a, I would, I would call it an imperial force, but either way, a political force or a governmental force was turning all the weapons of mass production and mass media out onto mm -hmm. the public. Yeah. And ben Amin is seeing a drastically different effect than most artworks. Mm -hmm. um, I think the easiest one to talk about in, in order to get at ben Amin's idea of aura is like the Mona Lisa. One of the most common questions I receive as a defender and apologist for the arts is basically like, what the heck is the big deal about the Mona Lisa? Yeah. We've all seen cups of it, movie posters. Yeah. We've all seen this like iteration over and over and over. And um, if I'm going to give Benjamin his due, I'll kind of give, I think, the Benjaminian argument for why he's right. Yeah. And it's like the Mona Lisa was such a special painting that when da Vinci made it, he didn't give it to the person who commissioned it. He kept it for himself. Mm -hmm. There's something so special about the experience of this painting. And it's not just like the painting symbolizes the beauty of femininity or something. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like some encapsulated phrase. Yeah. But it's like he was enchanted by the piece. Yeah. There's all of this art historical argumentation, you know, is it a self-portrait as a woman? Is it like his mistress actually that when whoever the Mona Lisa was was posing that he was actually like having a love affair with her? Who knows? Either way, something happened and he fell in love with this painting and wanted to keep it with him. And so this story like evolves and you know it, it, it goes through different hands and assume, uh, now it's in a museum. It's the most viewed work of art in the world. People go and like look at it, it's behind glass, you can barely even see it, it's like pretty far away, you know, all of this stuff. And, but still, it's like it's got a draw, a power. And that's why I think he's using that word aura of like, uh, it's like he doesn't believe in magic, but he wants to talk about the manner in which in the past we thought artworks had like magic in them, that there's like this seductive quality of the work. And now we, you know, if that were true, why isn't it still magical? People still go. They go on this pilgrimage to see this thing. And like every year, our department sends students to, and I always ask them, what do you think of the Mona Lisa? And I, across the board, everyone's like, huh? I, you know, I saw it. <laughs> Glad I saw it. Right. Yeah. And they can't but, even, like, no one's getting seduced like Da Vinci was. Yeah. And so what he's saying is, it's because you've seen it everywhere. You've seen all these banal images of it, and that has diminished the impact of that work of art. Mm -hmm. So that when you go and see it, actually, the work of art is not that special anymore. Yeah. And it's like, that kind of makes sense. I, I mean, he has a really, really good point there, when, and, and especially for his time, like, uh, where like not much was known about the human brain works, but habits and desens desensitization are like two very real parts of being a person like after you've seen something a hundred times you just you just can't pay attention to it in the same way that you want to yeah. like that's the reality of of just how how we function in any environment yeah and you can see um how this essay has impacted the art world even today when i was working at the ica in boston as a docent there were still some works of art that they're, you know, they're, they're being displayed by the museum, but they're not owned by the museum. They're on leave, mm -hmm. given to the museum for a period of time. And there are many collectors who, for various reasons, do not want the work photographed. So there were specific pieces we needed people to be aware and not allow photos to be taken. And there's some degree where it's stemming from this. Yeah. There's something weird when you reproduce an image where suddenly seeing it in person isn't that special. Yeah, or I mean, even, uh, I'd even point to with the galleries, the, the only, the two days that galleries will have the most and most people in them are without fail, the open and the close, which is marking, this is the first time you're going to get to see something, and this is the last time that you're probably going to get yeah. to see this for a little while. Yeah. Like, this is like, 
I'd love to see the Netflix streaming data on that. You yeah. Know, first week of a movie being available and then the last week of it being available. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, it's yeah. like being the... I've, I've watched, I've like seen movies on Netflix that like I had no interest in watching purely because Netflix will be like leaving soon. I watched, I watched uh, some movie the other day and I was like, oh, like I can watch it for free right now. I don't, yeah. I, I'll see, I'll watch it again. Might, might as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So we can see like um, a sense where Benjamin's saying that as technology changes, and, and honestly, we're at a similar place right now as we're considering what is being called generative AI. Um, I think that soon, if it hasn't already, if someone hasn't already do it, done it, there will be something called the work of art in the age of generative AI, mm-hmm. um, or or in the age of generative AI reproduction. Yeah. Um, but Ben means looking around and thinking like all of these things that used to have this power and this draw, this uniqueness, this specific place are suddenly being impacted and cheapened and is revealing that a lot of the so-called magic is not actually um, that legitimate. Mm -hmm. Because if it was, if if an artwork literally had some sort of magical power and you reproduced it, wouldn't it continue to carry that magical power with it? It doesn't. And so he's like, so there's something, he doesn't quite explain all of what it is, but it's like when you go and see the Sistine Chapel, there's something about that place. There's something about the fact that you're going into the Vatican City and you're seeing this chapel and there's these guards telling you no photo. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the it, it's actually a beautiful work. And you know the story of Michelangelo. And like all of these things that add to this cohesive experience that though we can technically reproduce the image quite perfectly, it's not exactly the same. But then he notices that subtle inverse, not even to say, oh, the reproductions aren't really the real thing. But on top of that, that the reproductions hurt the real thing. Mm-hmm. What do you, like, I th- that seems to make sense. Are you tracking with that? Like, I, I definitely, yeah, I really agreed with that, that yeah. portion of the essay. I mm-hmm. think that he's seeing something really, really clearly and remarkably, there's like a remarkable amount of foresight uh, where he even starts to talk about cinema and other other new forms of kind of media content that I believe are like a really good predictor of how we currently engage with things like uh, YouTube or TikTok or other like short form content where he starts to kind of talk about where is this going? Like what is this going to do to us and how we kind of see see everything and yeah. it all it all lines up really, really well. Yeah, he greatly impacts Marshall McLuhan, who's one of my favorite, uh, I would call it communication theorists mm-hmm. from the 20th century. Um, we might get to McLuhan, but I think we're going to run out of time. Before. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, so he he sees this problem that mechanical reproduction is cheapening the power of the artworks around him, and he also sees that political fascist regime mm-hmm. gearing up. And he's caught in the middle, literally, like Germany is kind of like the middle of the world at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, you have the capitalist West. On another hand, you have the communist East. And he makes throughout this this essay an argument for communism. But he gets there through saying, well, art used to serve the purpose of the cult. What did you make of that? Yeah, well, first of all, his his idea of the cult isn't so much the... uh He's not talking about cults and like the kind of the coven, the... the yeah, the, we, we often have a horror movie version. Yeah, of no, word. this has nothing to do with, you know, the Manson family or anything like that. That's, yeah. not, that's not at all what he's talking about. He's talking a lot more about uh, tradition and ritual in this kind of sense of... Well, and specifically religion. Yeah. Like cult comes from, like actually everything almost comes from the word cult. Cultivate, <laughs> yeah. all of that. Um, like... He's using cult in the sense of a group of people banded together around a transcendental idea that is most likely religious in nature. Yeah, yeah, and and I think, well, and he talks he talks a ton about um, through through that. Of course, you have these ideas of like tradition and ritual, and that's I remember yeah. he, he talks about the the ritual of making art and the ritual of viewing art. Like he talks about these rituals that are kind of getting lost in the in the mechanical reproduction, where it's right. like if you can see, 
Well, I think what you were just talking about with the Sistine Chapel, um, or the Mona Lisa for that matter, both of those things could really be considered pilgrimages. They're very strange pilgrimages that like mm -hmm. require you to get on a plane and you know make it through museum security. Um, or make it much past. harder than walking a thousand miles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make it past the no photo guards. But um, yeah. uh, but regardless, that is that is a sort of pilgrimage, a ritual. Like to yeah. see the Sistine Chapel is there's a predefined series of steps that I would need to take, yeah. and um, no reproduction will ever be able to recreate that experience. Right. Until until the metaverse. Yeah. Well. Um, until, until love, Facebook gets a little this bit This is better. a total non sequitur, but I love you've got the power of the metaverse, and one of the first things they decided to make was a grocery store. It's <laughs> like, my God, <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted to do virtually. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> be smarter in what you choose to, to reproduce. You could go anywhere. Yeah, you could Costco. go anywhere. And, <laughs> yeah, really crappy Costco. Um, yeah, but so, so, uh, Art is serving the cult, it's serving the religion, and, and he shows, you know, we can see this through art history. All of these objects that have survived, almost all of the early artwork is some form of religious object, whether that's uh, votive objects or temples mm -hmm. or, you know, all of these things that today we would say, like we would probably look back and say something like that's religious art, you know, like religious art is still being made. Mm -hmm. Churches, temples, all of the shrines, they're all still being made and decorated. Yeah. And that artwork still exists. Um, but that's not what we use artwork to serve anymore. Yeah. And he talks about this. Uh, he talks about so as humanity develops and, and art kind of the power of art, the manner in which it we see it and are enchanted by it and it impacts us, starts to make its way out of the temple or the cult area into public life through exhibition. But uh, he argues that even then, when you get mechanical reproduction, it um, completely uh, nullifies any of the real power of that artwork. So, you know, the museum, the fact that we can go and look at a painting together compared to the cult ritual object that only once you've gone into the Holy of Holies might you see the Ark of the Covenant. You know, it's like we've made it so that these artworks are more accessible, but they're still quite closed off. Mm -hmm. And what mechanical reproduction is, is it blows out the walls and it makes it so you can see the Mona Lisa at any moment in time, anywhere you are, as long as you've got the right device. And now, like, there's, there's no stopping it. There's no making it a specific moment. There's the Mona Lisa on my phone when I'm on the subway or anywhere. I think it's a, it's a really, <laughs> it's an interesting question because you could, you, could, you could ask how long would it take for you to see the Mona Lisa in any given year? And for hundreds of years, the answer was, uh, after, after its creation, for hundreds of years, the answer was never, like yeah. never. Some rich person owns it. Yep, and then maybe 80s, you know, if I wanted to see a picture of the Mona Lisa, probably a couple hours. Like I could get to a library and and find a picture of the Mona Lisa in a book pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And now that time is down to fractions of a second. Like I bet yeah. you, I bet you we could go outside of this room and ask anybody, hey, I need to see a picture of the Mona Lisa. And they could show it to us in like, in probably three seconds. Yeah. Which- Especially if they were already asking Siri something and I heard you say Mona yeah. Lisa. Or if somebody's already, somebody's already on their phone like checking their email, all um, I have to do is just type Mona Lisa and No, it's the there. really uncanny thing is now we're saying it so much is like when we load Instagram, how long will it take to get an ad <laughs> for the, that has the Mona Lisa <laughs> That's, in that's it. the truth, yeah. <laughs> oh God, we live in such a bizarre world. Yep. Um, yeah, well, so there's a couple lines that I want to read from, um, from it. He says, uh, the situations into which the product of mechanical reproduction can be brought may not touch the actual work of art, is what we're describing. Yeah. Like it could be in an ad on Instagram. Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with what da Vinci did. Yet the quality of its presence is always depreciated. The, authentic the authenticity of a thing is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history with which it has experienced. Since the historical testimony rests on the authenticity, the former, too, is, je is jeopardized by reproduction when substantive duration ceases to matter. What is really jeopardized when the historical testimony is affected is the authority of the object. It's like, that's a lot of philosophical jargon. 
but he's getting at what we're saying here is like you can experience the Mona Lisa now and millions of people have and they don't know who da Vinci is mm -hmm. they don't have any idea what the Renaissance is they don't understand that it's an interesting image yeah they maybe not even know that it's Mona Lisa and they're still experiencing it mm -hmm. which means that object and the authority it carried with it is gone yeah it's like it's just another image and most likely it's not stopping people yeah like it's not like it's it's not seducing them like da Vinci and so on the one hand it's like yeah this is cheapening everything and so what is what is his like he sees this as this is the problem we need to encounter the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction his basic thesis is it has to change What's, what did you feel his answer to that is? So what does art have to do in the age of mechanical reproduction? Yeah, so his, his argument is essentially that art now has a new role, that technology has progressed so far and so fast that we can't, we can't quite expect art to do the same things that it used to did, do. And now art should be used as um, essentially a, a political tool, a, uh, some sort of a, I mean, it, we can we talk about the definition of propaganda, but like that is that is the idea. Propaganda for good or bad is is the new purpose of art. Yeah, yeah. Why? Like, does that make sense to you? Why does he say that? Well, because like, he could go anywhere. He could be like the work of art is for fun. Yeah, fun or, or self expression, and he he really doesn't. And I think I think yeah. in large part this was the part where the um, the context of this article I think is like so important. Yeah. Where if you are a Jew living in 1930s, 40s Germany, and you're encountering like this solution, like what's on your mind? Your mind is politics and propaganda, especially yeah. when you consider, um, I mean, we touched on this briefly, and I think it's actually the thing. So people people always talk about Hitler going to art school, right? And yeah. like him like being kicked out of art school because the paintings like weren't that good or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think I think what people miss is that Hitler learned so much in art school and he really knew his way around propaganda. I mean, mm -hmm. incredibly well. Yeah. So so one of the things Walter Benjamin was seeing was art being used for propaganda in a terrifyingly effective way, in a way that rallied an entire country to do something awful. Yeah. There's no way the Louvre or any museum in Berlin is going to beat the propaganda campaign yeah and so we need art to be a counter propaganda yeah like there's there's a reason why um essentially fascist and nazi imagery is like still so present in everything that we see today like anybody who's ever seen star wars or marvel is looking at nazi or fascist imagery just constantly it's like it's the definitive symbol for totalitarian power is like this this series of symbols and colors that right, right. The, the Nazis came up with. Yeah. Yeah, they were um, unfortunately good at it. Unfortunately good at it, yeah. Um, and there have been other propaganda campaigns that are just as good. Yeah. And hopefully for better things. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but, but so we can see this all the time in contemporary art today. Like there are so many, I mean, we just had an exhibition at the museum here on campus called There's No Planet B. Mm -hmm. um, it, that is not saying that's propaganda. I'm saying that that is taking art for the service of political activism. Mm -hmm. um, we see this all around us of artists are constantly saying, you know, I'm, I care about the environment or I care about, um, you know, race relations or sex and, and gender relations. And yeah. it's, it's all our, uh, our work, our artwork is trying to serve political means because um, of what Ben means getting at here, of yeah. like all mechanical reproduction. The I, I would call it maybe to move away from that term that sounds so odd to most of our ears. You could call it mass uh, marketing, mm. mass communication. Yeah, like we didn't have this before. You know? Yeah, like you even like in the time of Rome, it's like you had a person makes a document in Caesar's palace. And they make copies of it and they send it out and they send it out all these town criers and they go and they stand in the marketplace and they read the decree and probably post it but most people couldn't read it mm -hmm. but it's like you ha like it's like a slow move as literally people have to the message has to travel yeah now it's like we can have thousands of these things like our phones have just sped up what Ben means experience yeah. is like you know we've all seen the uh 
the newscasters from like a thousand news channels saying the same sentence mm-hmm. that it happens. It's yep. like, it's so much faster now. Yeah. And so you can see this kind of feeling that um, the medium of communication necessarily needs to address politics, as in our communal actions that take place in public, because like we need a counter narrative. Yeah, and I, I think I think it might be important to kind of broaden out the idea of politics here from mm-hmm. just. Uh, you know, past past the two party system or past the American political system, and like talking about it essentially in the sense of, I guess you'd just call it like like social interaction. Like how is how are how is everybody interacting with everybody else? What are what are our culture's decisions about sex, gender, money, race, equality? Like mm-hmm. that's that's what he's addressing here because when he talked about politics, what he was talking about was like the survival of an entire, an entire group of people in a country. Like yeah, it, was, yeah. it was so much bigger than voting, you know. Right. What he's talking about is, um, yeah, politics for him is not like what we think about it, like, oh, Republicans versus Democrats. But it's more the philosophical understanding of the word, be- meaning what you do in public. Yeah. And so the po- political realm is anything outside of the privacy of your own home. Yeah. Uh, and, and, well, you could see this, like, so... When he's saying art serve the cult, he's talking about like, you know, uh, you could call it like tribal tribal or fam- familial kind of insular stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's slowly going from an, uh, a holy priest experiencing a work of art to a community experiencing. And now it's masses. Everyone experiences the same aesthetic communication device, the same work of art. And so that's what he means by because mechanical reproduction puts art into the mass communications, it must be made for mass communication. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, that's a lot. Like, Da Vinci was making Mona Lisa for a, a guy, like a single person. And now we're saying the artist has to make art for a billion people to receive. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that it, that will change what you make. It makes sense. And one of the most, there's there's that famous... In, in the entire communication discipline, there's the whole the the medium is the message idea, and that's yeah, which that's, is Marshall McLuhan. Oh, is it really? Yeah, I, I knew I recognized that name, but that is like you said that that's like the direct direct result of this. And I read more about the medium is the message without without hearing the author's name, but it's the same yeah. idea. It's just yeah. uh, if you were going to try and make art on TikTok, TikTok is permanently ingrained into your into your message. Like that's how it works. Right. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So th- this, l- let's let's pause here for a moment. It's, so I think we've said all, like a lot of the positive things for this essay, mm. and we're gonna, so it seems like he's got a lot right that mechanical reproduction drastically changes our perception of singular works of art, that it completely impacts and changes the nature of where artwork is shown, and so we need to reconsider what we're doing in our art. In order, I think at its core, it's the same thing as our first Wendell Berry essay, which is Wendell Berry's trying to figure out what's the responsibility of the poet, and Ben Hamid's looking around and thinking, someone's making this artwork that portrays me as a rat. Mm-hmm. And he's like, who's that guy? Yeah. Who's that artist doing that? Yep. Like, And what is the responsibility of that artist? Because it's going out into the masses, and now we've got Crystal Knock, and we've got the, you know, the things that he flees and yeah. sees coming. Like it's, this is salient to what his experience is. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of it centers around, you know, what's the responsibility of the artist? Yeah. And I think you and I, we live in the capitalist system. So yeah. we probably disagree with his longings for the communist system. Um, but we can see like why he's asking the question. So let's shift gears and let's talk about and and hopefully this will be cohesive. I think it is. I've got an inkling that I've got I've got one too. Right. There's there's one there's one section in here particular that I think that I think matches this perfectly. All right, all right. Um, so what is Walker Percy's The Delta Factor? <laughs> yeah. So besides a really cool Arnold movie, no, that's, that's Delta Force. <laughs> Delta Force. Is that an Arnold movie? I, I can't keep him straight. I think it's Arnold. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, Walker Percy. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. Another super interesting person, Catholic linguist, linguist, and he, I believe, is seeing the exact same thing that Walter Benjamin was seeing. Like, I think that they're looking at the exact same issue 
and they have these kind of wildly differing responses to them. Um, Walker Percy writes this essay and he starts it out with this like fantastic list of questions where he's just asking all of these things about why, why do humans act in such strange ways? He asks these questions about why is, why is man happiest not when he's um, you know, in his stable and boring suburban house, but when he's lost everything and all of a sudden he kind of really realizes the value of his family or why is, yeah. why are, why are cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy like somehow more in touch with themselves and their emotions yeah. than, you know, the, the average family during Thanksgiving dinner, like what's happening there? Why are people acting so strangely? Yep. Um, Which to kind of explain that, that, like even Tolstoy gets at this, like there's a character in Tolstoy who's of the aristocracy. And so it's the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. He's Russian. Uh, the characters in the aristocracy of Russia, of course, joins to be a military captain. And in the course of one battle notices how all of these aristocratic uh, officers have no clue what they're doing. And they're in like some of the beginnings of mechanized warfare. Like that was a brutal war. Mm -hmm. And he has this experience where he thinks he's dead, but he rolls over and he looks up and suddenly it's like he sees the clouds. Mm -hmm. And he's enchanted by the beauty of the clouds, which is like directly, Percy I don't think ever mentions that passage, but I know he's like, he's obviously read, this is from a uh, war and peace. Yeah. So he's obviously read this passage. And he's thinking about that of like suddenly, that character all of a sudden experiences life yeah. and sees life when he's been living his life the whole time. Yep. What happened to him? Or and that's what he's getting at. The cancer patient suddenly can enjoy a flower unlike ever before. We're, 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 uh, to tie it back to last week's conversation, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's essentially an essay that describes the entire premise of the movie Fight Club, right? Uh, Edward Norton's character who lives in the perfect Ikea apartment with the steady job and all of that is like wildly unhappy and he, he's only able to I don't, I don't think he's ever happy but he's only ever to find any sort of meaning meaning after like going down into these like barroom bracelet uh, barroom basements and like just fighting like just getting yeah. getting kicked down like that's how it works and they're like so happy they're so they're, happy like, nursing their yeah you know, hamburger face. Exactly, yeah. Um, but the passage in here in particular that I think was so, so interesting is he says at some point, and I'll have to paraphrase here, he writes it much better than I'll say it, but he, he asked the question of how come the only time somebody is actually able to see a painting is not when they're in a museum, but when they pull it out of an old box in the attic of a house that's like about to be destroyed or something like that. Yeah. He asks this question of like, why is it that the same painting can be seen at one time and not at another and like yeah. actually seen. So he's talking about all that stuff. And then what's the bulk of the essay about? <laughs> yeah, the bulk of the essay. About, <laughs> then then what he, he gets into his language. He mm -hmm. says, he says, well, I think I think the thing that we're missing here is that we fundamentally don't understand how man works. And one of the biggest things that we don't understand is language. Like, why is language functioning the way it does. He uses this character, uh, he calls himself the terrestrial, the terrestrial Martian, like an alien who knows nothing about Earth, but can, can somehow communicate and doesn't have language. And the alien is like just so perplexed by why people are talking all the time. He's like, why are you talking all the time? What are you saying? Why are you using these words? What does this mean? And, uh, and, the, and he realizes that no person on Earth has an answer to that question as to why we talk so much. Mm -hmm. And then he, so he, he continues this exploration and then he talks a lot about Helen Keller. Talks a lot Why about is Helen going. Keller. So that's a weird problem. We look at human beings, they're yammering on and they live in this strange post-war, mm -hmm. post-Walter Benjamin. We, we do all of this stuff. And it's like when the Martians looking, it's like they're just barking at each other. Yeah back and forth, half the time not really listening to each other. Uh -huh. You know, I just think about like, we, we believe our dialogue is always so dramatic and really it's like people are just talking over each other and past each other all the time. All the time. Very weird. And we're just going about our lives. Yep. And like, blah, 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 just all the time. And he's, you know, as he's viewing this as a Martian, mm -hmm. like what the heck's going on? And then suddenly he starts talking about 
Helen Keller, and this somehow helps him create a model that he thinks makes sense. Yeah. So his reason for using Helen Keller is the fact that she's she's extraordinary. Her whole story is extraordinary. But the the most important thing is that what she represents is a person who was born without language and then developed it late enough in life to describe the experience of going from somebody who had no language to somebody who had language. Yeah. And not only no language to some language, no language to being like a proficient communicator, somebody who could talk on stage and write books and like really talk a ton about like what's happening inside of their brain while they're trying to figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story uses the the classic Helen Keller story of, uh, I'm blanking on the name of her of her teacher, but um, in the book she just calls her teacher, I think. Mm -hmm. But the story of the first time that she understands what the word water means. Yeah, she makes some some sort of a jump happens, where it's no longer kind of how a dog scratches at the door because they need to be let out. It's like some some jump happens and Helen Keller is able to understand that this symbol for water, this sign for water, which I can make with my hands, is actually the same thing as the idea of water mm -hmm. and that everything in the entire world around her has a name that's connected in the same way. Yeah, she goes from being, I would call it, it's not even illiterate, it's like pre-linguistic. Yeah. And in one day, something happens and she learns 28 words. Yeah. And it's just like in one day. Yeah. Like that, uh, that's powerful. Yeah, mind-blowing. But, but the way that her teacher would, she'd put her hand under water on one hand and then she would write the word water on the other hand. Yep. And she did this for years. And then suddenly one day it clicked and Helen realized that what was happening in this hand was not in any way connected to this hand. You know, if you imagine you don't have language and every time your hand goes underwater, this other thing happens over here, they must be the same thing. Yeah. Like they must, it must just, it must just be what happens when you put your hand underwater. Yeah. And it's like, no, it, she realizes this whole concept of naming, which Percy calls the delta factor because the behavioralists are defining language as something akin to like, you know, you and I are pre-linguistic human beings out in the jungle and I make a noise and you look at me and then a saber-toothed tiger kills you. <laughs> and so over time within the group, we start coming up with a specific noise that means saber-toothed tiger. Yeah. Like, and so you know when I make this noise, you run rather than like looking at me like, what's the problem? Yep. Otherwise, the saber-toothed tiger can get you from behind. Yeah. And so there's this direct... You, you could call that signification rather than symbolization of words signify experiential things. And so therefore, that's how language emerges. And Percy's like, no, there's a big jump between, because she wasn't writing water, and then that was the sign, water's about to come. No, that was the name of water. Mm -hmm. and he's like, that's a triangle, yeah. hence delta, for those who don't know their Greek alphabet. Delta, the triangle is called the delta. Yeah. Um, and so he's saying that there's like this third thing. It's nonlinear and it's symbolic. And it leads to what he, he says, like the main thing that makes human beings stand out is the fact that we're symbol mongerers. We are so enamored with learning names and getting these lists and like this vocabulary for some reason. Like where, do you, where, do you, where does that take him in your opinion? Like how do you? Yeah, well, I think, I think to jump a little bit to the end, he, he definitely... He definitely doesn't say that he has a complete answer. He talks about it as if it's this black box where he's like, oh, I don't, it's crazy. Like that's kind of one of the things that he says about it is like, it is, it is a true kind of enigma of being human that yeah. we have language and we're so obsessed with symbols. Like yeah. that's, that's something it's, it's worth studying because it's so hard to understand. Right. Right. But, um, so let me, do you remember what happens to Heller, Helen, Heller? <laughs> What a strange smashing of her, her name ago. Um, what happens to Helen after she figures out this, after she has this moment where suddenly the delta factor has occurred? Yeah. She learns water. What then happens? Do you well, remember the story? In the story, I think it's like she, the, the, well, one of, the, one of the most significant jumps is realizing not just that water has a name, 
but that everything has a name. And she yeah. begins to like kind of like frantically run around her environment, like asking the name of things, like trying to trying to be like, what's this? What's this? What's this? And that's how she describes it in the next like like years of her life is just being enamored with this idea of like everything has a name and I can learn them yeah. all. There's a really powerful moment though, and that's one of the last things she well, I think it it's either one of the last things on that first day, or it might have been shortly after water. She runs to ask what her doll is called. Because oh. earlier in the day she had had a fit and had torn it apart. And she recalls after this that until she learned the name of the doll, she didn't feel guilt. Huh. It's like that's what? Yeah. Like, yeah, no, that is that. Like something in learning that the doll was specific suddenly made the actions before she knew the doll was specific she had been angry and so she tore this thing apart because it was just another thing and suddenly no it's a specific thing it's your doll and you tore it apart and now that bears weight and she she from helen keller's own words she describes it as she went from being like an animal or a beast mm -hmm. to being a human yeah and that's why Percy's so enamored with this, because he's trying to figure out, as a Martian, what are these weird humans? Why aren't they acting like any of the other animals? Mm -hmm. They're making art, they're singing, they're telling stories. They're looking at art and then writing articles in order to try to figure out what's going on in as the rise of Nazi fascism all around. Like, yeah, what's, no what's, dog did that. <laughs> no you dog know? has ever. No actual rat. I mean, why didn't the rats look at the posters and think, oh, they're talking about us? Yeah. And, and why didn't the humans look at the Nazi posters and think, oh, we better get some, you know, we better kill these rats in the corner. Yeah. And by that, I mean actual rats. I don't obviously believe that the Jewish, like, that's horrible. Of course. But it's like, no, we knew that the propaganda was a symbol. Yeah. That it meant something else. It pointed in some manner very different than significance. It symbolized something. Mm -hmm. And this is where, uh, I th well, okay, so uh, I don't want to jump to why I, th why I think that these are working together. But I'm wondering, what did you see the connections between these two? Because the, on the face of it, I think for anyone happening to listen to this, these are two very different essays. Yeah, yeah. The story of uh, the story of Helen Keller and the story of why photographs make art a little bit less important are like, it's like, oh man, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But um, I'll, I'll have to. This, this is one of the ones that I had to take a lot of notes on. So yeah, I'll yeah. be, I'll be looking back at my, um, at my notes here. But as I said a little bit earlier, Walker Percy and Walter Benjamin are, they're looking at the same thing. Like they're looking at this same strangeness in human behavior that there doesn't seem to be an explanation for. And, and they, they pose two different solutions to this issue. Um, Walter Benjamin kind of looks at it from this, this idea of, okay, so art is very different now. Everything seems to be politics. Art's role is to help us have better politics, like a more kind of human-centered version of politics that won't result in the awful things that I see happening around me happen. Mm -hmm. um, which, I, to some extent, like I think we both said, like it makes sense. Like he's he's got a point there. Um, Walker Percy sees this same issue and says the fundamental thing that's happening is that there isn't man doesn't have a theory of himself. And man can't really make, man is too close to himself to make a theory. And then that's the actual issue here. The actual issue here is that we can't, we can't understand ourselves. And if we ever want to have a chance of understanding ourselves, we need to understand why language is working in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So one of the quotes that, um, in my opinion, starts to draw them closer and is getting at what you're saying. Um, Benjamin writes that mechanical reproduction of art changes the reaction of the masses toward art. The reactionary attitude towards a Picasso painting changes into the progressive reaction towards a Chaplin movie. And he talks about how film in particular is so different than having an intimate experience with a work of art that it's like we all become critics. Like when you're sitting in the movie, there's such a detachment that 
you start critiquing it rather than experiencing it. And, and which I think is true. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, this is around the time when the, the idiom, everyone's a critic starts rising, you know, like, yeah. but our, our mass communication, it's, um, it's like we've taken language, which was meant, or, or, or you could say it evolved in small groups, mm -hmm. dialogues, two people talking. Yeah. And then we've amplified it to where it's like, you can talk to a billion people at once or you can talk to a whole nation all at once. Mm -hmm. It's like, is language suitable for that? Which is where McLuhan starts going with mm -hmm. the medium is the message that you gotta think about what are the inherent limitations of the medium. But Benjamin goes and says, this, this is my fundamental critique of Benjamin, is he says that m mechanical reproduction diminishes the aura of the artwork. I think he's wrong. I think the aura of the artwork is there it diminishes our capacity to experience the aura. It changes us, not the artwork. And so what that means, like, like you can actually read about and learn to go see the Mona Lisa properly because this is a fact of the Mona Lisa. Um, like it or not, as in you might have different beauty standards, but Mona Lisa at the time was apparently a very attractive woman. <laughs> um, which is hard for us in these, this day and age. But you got to remember, you know, 1400s, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different standards and different diseases that people were falling victim to all the time. Um, so there's certain reasons why they might find that attractive. But it's like, think about, uh, you're, you're a, a straight man, mm -hmm. so you find women attractive, some of them more than others. Yeah. When an extremely attractive woman walks in the room, and this doesn't have to be yourself in this picture, but um, is she, what is the proper way to look at an extremely attractive woman who has walked in a room that say is like, you know, say you're in class and there's 10 or 15 people and an extremely attractive woman walks in, what should you be doing with your eyes? I mean, I think it's like, the word that comes to mind to me is like, oh, like you act respectfully. You acknowledge uh -huh. them as a person, and then that's kind of like that's that's your due. You're, you've you've acknowledged them as a person, and then you go back to whatever you're doing. Like okay, that's the that's the point. And if someone just gawked, mouth agape yep. at her and stared at her, what kind of what would you think that person? Like, what would the response be to that? Oh, person? you're a total creep. Like, stop. <laughs> stop treating that person yeah. like they're nothing but an, an object. Like, yeah. Like, mind your own. They're right. just there's another person. Right. So think about it. It's like, imagine this not as a form of communication. That's what we're in the Benjaminian world. And so we think a painting is like a communication, mm -hmm. it's telling me something. No, it's a beautiful woman you're not supposed to just stare at it. Mm -hmm. Everyone just stares at it. It's like, like on, honestly, I'll be more crass than you. Um, I can take more arrows. It's like a beautiful woman walks in. It's like you see her out of the corner of your eye. You look, you look away. You start getting, oh, that oh, was interesting. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mood lighting for we, the. <laughs> we've got a. Oh, we're blocking our. Yeah, thinks, we're blocking. It thinks sensitive. we're not moving. Oh, can you turn no, it down yeah. now? We need a bom, bom, bom. <laughs> well, I'll put that in post, don't worry. Oh, God. Uh, the this this these... is the one. This is one where we, where we lose everyone. <laughs> we finally crossed the line. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be more, um, more crass about like actually what most men do. Mm -hmm. It's like beautiful woman walks in. You notice her out of the corner of your eye and you like start turning, but then you look away. Yeah. Because you can't be caught looking at the object. Uh, and so you, your temperature goes up, you maybe start sweating, and you're like darting glances at her because obviously you want her to look at you. It's like that's what we all want. Yeah. We want to be the object of her attention. So then it becomes a game of what do I have to do to be the most interesting man in the room? And this is like all of the things of like any time a beautiful woman walks in and men are in any kind of arrangement that might quickly turn into competition, it immediately turns into a competition. Every single time. Oh, and you can see like all of the different strategies from, you know, the negging people, you know, like the acting like she's nothing and treating her like trash, all the way down to the, I am so shell-shocked, I don't know what to do but to stare. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is what's happening. 
That's what the experience of the painting of the Mona Lisa is supposed to be like. There's a really beautiful woman over there. What do you not, like the thing you're not supposed to do, look directly at it. Mm -hmm. That's why it's such an enchanting painting. Because when you look near the Mona Lisa to where you can kind of make it out in your field of vision, it looks like she's smiling at you. Then you look at her because you're like, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. Get the pretty woman to smile at you. Yeah. Then when you look at her, she's no longer smiling. And so it's like the painting is a coy experience of flirting with an attractive woman. That's why no one, like, we don't care about that anymore. Yeah. We've got, like, everything in the sense of, you know, in the sense of attractive women. Like, my God, the, the female body in the age of internet pornography. Yeah. It's like, what does that do to the female body? What is the, if the photograph diminished the artwork, what did pornography do to our experience of beauty? It's like, all of this is impacting us to where, again, like, my pushback on Benamine is, it's not that these things diminish the artworks, it's that they diminished us mm -hmm. and our capacity to see. And so no one understands that you're supposed to go into this coy game with the Mona Lisa because there's, there's, a very, there's a wonderful book written about Mona Lisa's smile. And basically the way that it functions is there's a strange underpainting that causes a luminosity issue where your peripheral vision notices black and white most prominently and your focal vision notices color difference most prominently. Mm -hmm. And so in your peripheral vision, you see her smiling because there was an underpainting of her smiling. But in your focal vision, when you look, that smile disappears and she's not smiling anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's this weird effect that like, especially before film and video and like, you know, like we look at that, it's like, oh, whatever, a nice little optical trick. We've got like movies on our telephone, you yeah. know? Da Vinci, they had nothing. They had Greek sculptures, <laughs> you know, and literally that was their pornography. Like they would, all of those sculptures in, in the museums, like they were used for sexual stimulation is how I'll put it. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's very odd. We've, we've completely changed the way we look at these things. And so the, the it, it would be akin to um, Da Vinci had the Delta factor for what the Mona Lisa is. He understood that there's something here, even if he couldn't name it, so much so that he reneged on his, his commission and kept the painting for himself. Yeah. He knew it as more than just that painting. Mm -hmm. And the, what my argument for the connection of these things is, Percy's getting at the human condition is something special about noticing when things are symbolic, when they are more than just an experience in the physical world, but they're a named thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that Benjamin is right in saying that mechanical reproduction drastically changes the way human beings communicate and the way we relate to art. But I would say it's more like it's cutting off the top of that pyramid and it's going down to a behavioral point of view of saying, all of our um, experiences of art become far more like a, it goes from a person experience of a work of, experiencing a work of art and enjoying it for whatever that work of art is going to do to them to a tell me what this artwork means. What is the point? Yeah. And that I think is like, like because it, propaganda it needs to directly tell you the point, otherwise it's not good propaganda. Yeah. If you look at the Nazi propaganda and you don't think, oh, those people over there, I want to kill them, it did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Whereas like an artwork isn't supposed, an artwork is supposed to be an experience of something. Yeah. So I, I don't know, when you hear me say that, like, I don't know, is that a, co do I have a coherent no, argument No, no, you do, because the, the, the thing that is, the thing that the, my my biggest critique of this essay as well is that what it's what it's dependent on is that as artwork is being mechanically produced that everybody is being exposed to that same uh to those same reproductions right which is yeah. essentially like what you're saying but the truth is is that and i think that's the strongest the strongest defense for it. it's not changing the artwork it's changing the people who are exposed to those reproductions yeah because somebody who has never seen the mona lisa before could will see the Mona Lisa and the Mona Lisa is not is not changed it is not diminished like taking the picture of the Mona Lisa doesn't 
for we're ignoring flash photography here, but taking a picture of the Mona Lisa changes nothing about that painting right. if you haven't ever seen the picture. Right. It's that same, um, it's like that old superstition about like when photography was first happening, people didn't want to be photographed because they thought that like a photograph captured some part of your soul. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And which is which is an interesting idea, but it's uh, that's that's essentially the argument that's being made here. Whereas I would say, oh, if I if I don't think that you know being photographed takes any any portion of my soul away, I shouldn't care about whether or not I'm photographed. Right. I shouldn't care about whether these things are being reproduced. However. If a photograph is taken of me and then everybody looks at that photograph more of me, well, that has changed something. Now all of a sudden people know me through that photograph, not because of who I am. Right. And that is a different experience. Mm -hmm. And their experience of me will be significantly altered because they'll right. see me and think, that's the guy from the photograph, not, who's that? Right. That's right. Gabe. Right. Well, and you had an experience like that today where someone saw you and recognized you, not because of who you were, but because you were like kind of a copy of your mom. Yeah, somebody, somebody who'd known my parents 20 years ago saw me and said, you must, you must be a Kimball. You must be related to your mom. And I said, yeah. that's so crazy, yes. Yeah, and it's like when she's seeing you, it's not like she's seeing you, she's seeing your mom. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing as like the impact of the mechanical reproduction changes not the thing, but how we see the thing, mm -hmm. which, which so hopefully... I, th I think this has been a long conversation to get back to this question. So what are we to do as artists? Is like, on the one hand, we have to know our audience. Mm -hmm. We have to know their strengths and weaknesses. We, if, if we're going to be making art for any of the people that are around us, we have to understand where they, where they are in, in history. Mm -hmm. Where they are in history is they are bombarded with images that are easily understandable. It's like... I like to think of it like a high fructose corn syrup diet. Yeah. It's like if you're a nutritionist and you need to figure out how to cut through all of the bad nutritional information that most modern Americans are eating, you have to understand where they are. And you can't just be like cut everything out. It's like no, I can't. I can't literally change everything of the thousand things I eat per month. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you have to figure out a way to f meet them where they're at and start making small incremental changes to help them along the path to where finally they're healthy because they're eating healthy food. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's where we are. We, we're in a community, a, a, a society that is eating propaganda, mm -hmm. political propaganda from corporations, from politicians, from ideologies, from everything. Everything is communicated in this very short, hard to not understand, or yeah. uh, hard to misunderstand, very obvious kind of way, and that's the milieu. There's a great, I say this all the time in design too, we read most what we read best. Yeah, It's not, which is a, uh, I believe it's a Gaudi quote, and he's talking about bad typography, but it's true of like, artists need to understand this, that if your artwork is going to be even recognizable in the sense of our last conversation of let alone newsworthy, but recognizable as a message in a bottle. Mm -hmm. You need to understand what kinds of bottles are landing on the shore in order to either contrast them, but you also have to be united to them. If it, if it like, if you if your bottle is encrusted in stones because you're like a really cool message maker, and in fact it actually just kind of looks like a stone, maybe no one finds it. Mm -hmm. And that's like, Benjamin, uh, again, I'm not, I, I don't know, you know, what would Benjamin have written now if he hadn't have been in Nazi Germany trying to figure out what the heck is going on? Yeah. You know, I, I have no clue what he would have thought. So I don't criticize him for my disagreements with him. I think that his essay has resilience in the test of the last century. Yeah. I also think it has some weaknesses. And there are some things we should really go back and think about in the age of, uh, artificial intelligence and generative reproductions, mm -hmm. but um, you know, there's there's a oh, I lost I lost my train there. I lost it. We were talking about uh, easy to discern images, propaganda, um, what we read most, what we read best. Yeah, and and Benjamin is is trying to think about that same question of what what are we to do. Um, yeah, I really just lost it. I don't know. 
I don't know where I was going with that. Well, I can I can say um, it's it's a again I, I think I think that he poses a poses a one of like the most important questions, and I, I think that again like whether or not I, I disagree with his kind of his response to it is a little bit beside the point because clearly the fact that um, like I said I talked to to a couple professors about this. And, and all of them said, oh, that should be required reading. Like, I'm so glad that you've, you've kind of like landed on that through whatever, through this thing you're doing with Greg. But they've said like, yeah, like tell all your friends to read that essay. Like, like so it's clear that it has some sort of relevance yeah, yeah. That, that is sticking true. Because I, I know for a fact that not, not everybody, everybody I talk to even agrees with it. But regardless, everybody who I bring it up to is like, oh, thank goodness you're reading it. Like, yeah. thank goodness you're actually trying to understand what he's saying here. Well, and it's it's one of those things where, like, I mean, from the quotes I read, it's you know, it's it's dense and difficult. It's philosophical language. Like mm-hmm. he's a philosopher at his core. Um, but I was I was wondering maybe this is maybe I'll come back. I, I really forgot where I was going with that sentence. But I had you open up some some Andy Warhol because I think that Andy Warhol is one of the artists that um, either intentionally or not is testing these ideas the most obviously Mm -hmm. so if you open up the image that we're looking at there the first one of jesus um i think it's the other page yeah there we go there we go yep so describe what you're looking at yeah so what we have is uh a like a famous a famous image of jesus like like a very recognizable oh that's that's jesus christ it's this uh i think it's like it's some sort of an it's not even like a it's like a painting that you'll find in every church everywhere, no matter what sort of church it is for mm-hmm. some reason. But then what Andy Warhol has done is he's turned it just black and yellow and he's repeated it and tiled it. Uh, I think it's something like, I remember reading about this piece, it's some above 160 times, it's a ton of times down the entire length of a wall. I think it's more than 160. I'm just looking at how many I can see in this image. Like it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I read Four it. tall and so it's like, Probably a hundred. Like I wouldn't be surprised if it's more like two hundred or four hundred, but it's a lot of times. No There's a couple other things to note about what he's doing here because, so he, this is a screen print or mm-hmm. silk screen, which means that there's various ways in which he got this. Probably he got it by taking a photograph of the first painting. Mm-hmm. So it's like oh, like like any time in modern art when you think about. When photo is being incorporated, especially a uh, pre-digital camera, yeah, you know that they're thinking about Benjamin. Oh yeah. So it's like photograph a painting, reproduce it, do it in silk screen, which is a form of mechanical reproduction. Mm-hmm. So he's making a screen that he can press ink through, that it has been mechanically manipulated through another photo process to block out certain areas and allow ink in other areas. Mm-hmm. And so then he does this over and over and over and over and over. And if if he's a good Benhamanian um, who believes that he's hurting an image, then what does that make you think that he's doing to Jesus? Yeah, it's like it's like if we were to take Benhamian as his most literal and Andy Warhol as his most literal, like what he's doing here is purposefully diminishing the image of Christ. Mm-hmm. Purposely trying to remove the aura from this original image in this this like super fast like if you think about like a, a photograph kind of taking one little chunk of that image away it's like he's got some sort of a a machine gun that's like just chipping away at the aura as fast as he can just another image another just throw it through the scanner again print it again oh, I want a I want a gun that makes Jesus <laughs> noises or something <laughs> like, like yeah like. Yeah. Over and over and over and over, and uh, Jonathan Anderson has a talk on a similar. There's a different Jesus piece as well, and he talks about how it's like, it's like you're seeing a visual representation of an auditory experience, just like Jesus, 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 mm-hmm. Jesus, 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 where it's like it gets to that place where when you're repeating a word over and over, where suddenly you wonder where does the word begin, and so it's like, is it just G? Zusji, yeah. Zusji, Zusji. It's like where, you know, it all blends and it just becomes sound. Yeah. It's like that's, it's like we're experiencing just Jesus over and over to the point that it becomes like a wallpaper instead of a focal point. Yeah. Instead of a particular painting. 
Yeah, Walker, Walker Percy says something, he talks about that that strange phenomenon. I forget what use, word he uses in, in his essay, but he talks about, he asks you to say a word 50 times out loud while you're reading his essay yeah. and see how it changes it. And I, I didn't actually do it, but like I've done that before with words yeah. where, you know, even in a conversation, if you're saying somebody's name too much at some point, I was like, what is this weird word? What is word, word, what's happening? What does that mean? Yeah. And... And that's exactly what this is. It's like, oh, like at what point does it just turn into mush? And this is where like, I want to flip it and point out that I really think Ben Hameen has some fundamental problems in what he's saying. Mm -hmm. This doesn't diminish Jesus. Yeah. It points out to me that my symbol of Jesus isn't big enough. As in when I hear the word Jesus, I think of something. But then it's like when you see it over and over, it's like, man, does, does the symbol of Jesus transcend that? Mm -hmm. does it, is it resilient enough to resist this? Mm -hmm. And does this in any way reveal another aspect? So I want to say not only, like my, my big pushback to Benjamin would not only be, I think that in general reproduction limits us and limits our ability to access and realize there's a symbol, but then there's another weird thing it does. And that is that it creates every reproduction has its own individual aura. And so like every single one of those little paintings, that's mm -hmm. the reason he used the, the one of the things Warhol was really fascinated in was the degradation of the mechanical reproduction as it is used. And so like a mold, when it's used over and over, anyone in uh, manufacturing understands that eventually you have to replace your molds. Mm -hmm. Eventually you have to replace your silkscreen because it gets gunked up, yep. no matter how well you clean it. Eventually, things start sticking, and the screen starts getting slightly off, and just things in the machine aren't perfect. Even like this one's, I think, in the mid-70s is when he made this one. Um, even by, you know, from 1935, Ben Hameen's thinking of mechanical reproduction as nearly perfect. And by the 70s, it's still like, eh, it still degrades. Yep. And even today, it's still not perfect. We, st you know, we have a lot of better tolerances now but um so he's looking at the fact that this thing that seems so ubiquitous and like i'm making the same image over and over if you look at every single one of those jesuses they're all slightly different mm -hmm. there's something there that i think warhol's getting at that it's like is it that meaningful to have a mona lisa on a mug mm -hmm. i don't think so yeah but I also wonder, but maybe it could be, you know, like what is there some way in which suddenly the mechanical reproduction can actually expand the aura of a piece because suddenly it's like we've got Mona Lisa on the top of, you know, uh, the Great Wall of China in a mug with a, you know, of course, an American flag sticking out. That's <laughs> that's the image that popped in mind. <laughs> of course, too much. See, I've had too much political propaganda. Mm, yeah. of flag plant planting, um, but it's like you know, there's something about it that suddenly it's like uh, when art and symbols were inside these institutions, like religion or like na nations, there was a lot more control over what the symbols could be. And in the course of mechanical reproduction, we constantly talk about the democratization of the tools of production. Mm -hmm. So Adobe Illustrator and yeah. Photoshop, it's like anyone can use them. And the internet blows this up like crazy. It's like, did it, uh, if, you're, if you're a good, if you follow Benjamin to his logical conclusions, you have to say that in the sense of making special objects, we're screwed. Yeah. Like we, we ruined special objects yeah now all we can do is try to preach the right propaganda yeah and it's like i don't think that's true no and that's uh i mean it's a it's a really depressing thought mm -hmm. like it really is the idea that we've um taken some step so far with technology that we've ruined art <laughs> it's like yeah. is it it's a hard thing to stomach it's a it's something that as an artist, I certainly don't want to believe. Like, yeah. I don't want that to be true. Yeah, and that, that's where I think, uh, yeah, I would settle on the more important thing for an artist to realize in the sense of newsworthiness is understanding the capacities of the audience. And personally, not judging that. 
every single audience throughout history. There wasn't some perfect audience that actually understood art. It's oh, yeah. like, no, it's, they're always biased. They're always in their unique ways. I don't think there's something uniquely, uniquely damnable about our current age, Yeah. but it is a unique age. Yeah, or it's like you could even look at it like, um, you know, so many people will, will point back to, you know, the traditional church art, right? Religious art. And it's like, well, the people looking at that art, they literally couldn't read. Like, they, that was that was hard. Like, talk about a major problem with your audience. It's like so many of those images have text or writing in them. And they were making them for an audience that literally had no idea what was happening. The, the, yeah. the first thing they could get was there's words on that. Like that's that's a hard issue to overcome with your audience. Yeah, so yeah. and they they still did it. They still right. made right fantastic pieces of artwork. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I I I can't remember what we're reading next, but this was our our foray into the beginning of modernist aesthetics, uh, and my my rebuttal to it. Um, do you have any last thoughts for us? I I don't think so. Other than I think that uh. Taking taking two completely different essays and trying to trying to find a link in between them was uh, one of so far one of my favorite reading experiences oh. for this. I, th I thought this was an interesting way to go about it. So. Excellent, excellent. I think if if my list is correct, the next up we're gonna read uh, Saunders, and uh, we're gonna try to tackle. Okay, so so what do we need to do as we make works of art to try to. Um, yeah, make them good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's this question of if, if it art if art needs to be news and if art needs to be able to be understood by its audience, but also not just be propaganda, because propaganda is news. Like, yeah. how do we how do we find that line? How do we make something that has meaning and depth to it without it being you know just a McDonald's logo? How, yeah. does, how do I how do I make art that isn't just about yeah. loving wanting the next cheeseburger? Excellent, excellent. Well, with that. Sounds good. We're good.